This is Philosophy Bites with me, David Edmonds. And me, Nigel Warburton. Philosophy Bites is available at www.philosophybites.com. Plato, then Aristotle, then forward 700 years to St. Augustine. That would be the standard hop, skip and jump through the history of philosophy. In fact, there were several important figures in between. One such was Plotinus. A little is known about him. He was born in Egypt, he studied in Alexandria, he spent most of his last years in Rome. He was at various times a student, a soldier, a teacher. Augustine would be heavily influenced by him. One of the issues Plotinus grapples with is the problem of evil. But as Peter Adamson of King's College London explains, Plotinus' problem of evil was not exactly the same as the one that exercises theologians today. Peter Adamson, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Hello, it's nice to be back. The topic we're going to focus on today is Plotinus, but specifically Plotinus on evil. But before we get into that, could you just say a little bit about who Plotinus was? Sure. Plotinus is a 3rd century philosopher, 3rd century AD, and he's the founder of a school of thought called Neoplatonism. Plotinus is probably the most important ancient philosopher other than Plato and Aristotle, in part because Neoplatonism is the dominant way of doing philosophy in the late ancient world. But what was Neoplatonism? It sounds like it's just a new kind of Platonism. That's right, and that's why modern scholars have described him as a Neoplatonist, but he would not have described himself that way. He would have just said he was a Platonist, and he would have said that his philosophy was explaining the philosophy of Plato. But a lot has happened between Plato and Plotinus. Aristotle, the Hellenistic schools like the Stoics and the Epicureans to whom he's responding. So one of the reasons it's different is because he's woven other philosophical elements into a Platonic system. Perhaps the most distinctive thing about Plato's metaphysics was his notion of the forms. Could you outline what that theory of forms was? Sure. Platonism is famous for postulating the existence of two kinds of entities, physical entities and intelligible entities. The physical entities are the ones we're familiar with, everyday objects and people, animals. The forms are the things that give those objects their natures. So, for example, there would be a form of man, which would explain why I'm a man. So it's by participating in that perfect man that I'm a man. This may be a kind of difficult example, but if you think about a more intuitive example, for example, a circle. So there's lots of circular objects in the world, but when mathematicians study circles, they don't study this circle or that circle. They study the perfect circle, the form. Plotinus had quite a lot to say about the problem of evil, but what he meant by the problem of evil was something quite different from what we now would mean by that. That's right. So if you think about what I just said, you have these two kinds of objects, intelligible objects, which are perfect, and physical objects, which are different from intelligible objects. Well, how are they different? One way that they're different is that they're imperfect. The form of man doesn't suffer from bad breath or old age and won't die, but real people do. And some people think, and probably Plotinus would have thought, that you wouldn't find perfect circles even in the physical world. In a sense, he's trying to explain that. And here I think it's important to notice that he's really talking about a different problem than the contemporary problem of evil. So you've had a show about that as well. So in that earlier podcast, which Stephen Law did, he distinguished between the logical problem of evil and the evidential problem of evil. The logical problem of evil is that the existence of evil is logically incompatible with the existence of God. The evidential problem is that the existence of evil gives us very good reason to think that God doesn't exist. I think what Plotinus is worried about could be better described as the metaphysical problem of evil. Given that God is perfectly good, how is it that God could have generated imperfect things? Just as water doesn't make things dry, so God, who is perfectly good, cannot explain imperfection. But according to Plotinus, everything comes from God. So there's a problem. How do you explain the presence of imperfection in a world that came from a perfectly good God? We should make clear that Plotinus is not talking about a Christian god here. Yeah, that's right. He would have supported what's called Greek pagan religion, so the notorious Greek gods. But he also believes, I guess, in monotheism. So he thinks that there's a first principle, which is perfectly one, perfectly good, and is the source of all oneness and goodness for the rest of creation. So for Plotinus, there is this perfectly good God and there's an imperfect world which includes not just the kinds of things we traditionally think of in the problem of evil such as torture or earthquakes and famine 
but also the imperfection of human beings in the fact that they aren't perfectly beautiful or perfectly intelligent. Yeah, in fact, if you want a really good example to think about for Plotinus on evil, rather than thinking about moral evil, it's probably better to think about something that's really ugly. For example, a really ugly dog or a really ugly sick tree that's the problem he's trying to solve. So how do you have things like that in a world that came solely from a principle of good? How do you have imperfection then? Well, what he's going to say is that imperfection only exists within something that has some degree of goodness. If you take, for example, our tree, our tree has the ability to take in nutrition from the ground, to absorb sunlight, it has a structure, and these are all ways, according to Plotinus, of being good. These things don't explain the imperfection of the tree. Rather, these things have to be in place before the tree can be imperfect. If the tree didn't have any kind of structure or intelligibility or form, then you wouldn't have an ugly tree, you'd just have nothing at all. So we've got our tree which is imperfect, but I still don't understand how a perfectly good god gives rise to such a thing that's imperfect. So what Plotinus is going to say is that insofar as the tree has these kinds of goodness and determinacy, intelligibility, ultimately it derives from this good first principle. The first principle is not responsible for the fact that the tree falls short of what it could be. The first principle is ultimately responsible for the fact that it is as good as it is. But here's the really crucial thing. Evil in its own right, according to Plotinus, does not exist. There's no such thing as pure evil. And you can immediately see why there's no such thing as pure evil. Imagine what it would be like. Well, it wouldn't have any kind of determinacy. It wouldn't have any aspect at all which was in any way good. But that means, according to Plotinus, that it couldn't exist. It couldn't even have, for example, a physical shape. Because if it had a physical shape, then that shape would be a kind of determinacy and intelligibility. It would be a kind of goodness. But we do have things which are very evil, like some people could be extremely evil people. What he will say about that is that that proves his point. So think about really evil people who are famous for being really evil. Well, one thing about people who get famous for being evil is that they're really good at getting things done. They've got great organizational talent, or they're able to convince people to follow them, or they're good-looking, or they're physically strong. If you take away these good features of a really evil person, you're left with something pretty harmless. And if you keep going down and taking away the good more and more and more, then what you're left with is nothing. The problem only comes when you've got evil, which is pure lack or absence. It's the falling short. The problem only comes when you've got that joined to a lot of goodness. That's when you get the trouble. The ugly tree is ugly because it lacks something, namely a beautiful shape. What about moral evil, which is, of course, the case we're most interested in? Well, the reason why moral evil is a kind of falling short or absence for Plotinus is that it's a failure of the human in question to, for example, grasp the good or to look at a situation and see what ought to be done. And insofar as they fail to do that, they're falling short of perfect rationality. So if I've understood you correctly, what you're saying is that evil is just a series of absences. Everything evil in the world is a lack of something. It's not actually a positive force in the world. And not only that, but it's an inevitable absence. A good metaphor for this might be Swiss cheese. If you think about a block of Swiss cheese that's got all these holes in it, you have to have the holes, or it won't be Swiss cheese, right? That just comes with the metaphysics of Swiss cheese. And the holes are like evil. The holes is precisely where you don't have the cheese, and you could have had cheese. So there's some potential cheese there that hasn't been actualized. And in the limit case, just as you can't have pure evil, so you can't have a round of Swiss cheese, which consists entirely of holes, right? That's not cheese, that's just air. And does it follow from what Plotinus says about this that every physical thing, everything that exists in the world, is imperfect? So it's all got some element of evil in it. Yes, it does. And he thinks that for a very specific metaphysical reason. If we go back to this idea about pure evil, so something that doesn't exist at all, that could just be complete absence or nothingness. But there's another way of thinking about it. Suppose that evil is a kind of falling short of what something should be. What we have here is a potentiality that hasn't been realized. Well, imagine if there were something that was just pure potentiality, something that was nothing other than the unrealized capacity to have various kinds of determinacy and goodness. Well, in ancient metaphysical context, there is something like that. And Plotinus believes in something like that. It's called matter. If you think about physical objects, what they are, at least according to Plotinus, is various kinds of determination given to matter 
which is a potential to be any physical object whatsoever. Matter underlies all physical objects sort of at the bottom. And Plotinus thinks that because matter is pure potentiality, it can explain the presence of imperfection and evil in the world. And since evil is a kind of falling short, and since falling short is a way of having an unrealized potentiality, something that was pure potentiality, namely matter, would in a sense be the ultimate principle of evil. So for that reason, he thinks that you only get imperfection and evil in the physical world because it's only in the physical world that you have unrealized potential. In the intelligible world, everything is purely actual. There is no potentiality at all. Does it mean that we have some kind of moral obligation to strive for greater perfection? Yes, that's a really good point. And in fact, that's really the basis of his ethics. So what he thinks is that humans have a potentiality to do all kinds of things, but ultimately will be most fully realized when we, for example, do philosophy and come to grasp the forms. And if you think about also doing good things in other arenas, so for example, cooking a good meal, playing a good game of football, the point of that is always to realize some potentiality as well as it can be realized to get as close as you can to perfection. Of course, in some sense, as long as you're thinking about things that happen in the physical world, this is almost an inevitably tragic attempt, right? Because as long as you're still within the physical world, you're going to remain within the realm of imperfection. So I just want to get clear about what matter is, because in ordinary language, physical objects around me are made out of some kind of matter. That's not what you mean here, is it? Right, I'm not talking about wood or steel or styrofoam or anything like that. What Plotinus will say is that just as you can't have pure evil, you can't have pure potentiality. What would that be like to walk into a room and say, ah, there's a big pile of pure potentiality sitting in the middle of the room? It's inconceivable. But you still need to have it because otherwise there's no explanation of how actuality exists in the world, right? In order to have varying degrees of actuality, you need to have something that takes on that actuality, and that's matter. One way of thinking about it, which goes back to Aristotle, is that you can use matter to explain change. Just as wood, for example, can go from having the form of a tree to having the form of a table, so, as it were, all the way at the bottom, matter is what can go from having any particular form to any other particular form. It's completely indeterminate, and what that means is that it has an indefinite or infinite range of possibility and potentiality. We started off by saying that Plotinus's problem of evil wasn't our contemporary problem of evil, but do you think there's anything in Plotinus that could shed light on what we might mean by the problem of evil? I think it would. It's easy to say, well, Plotinus is this very otherworldly guy. He was a strange guy, right? So, for example, his students wanted to paint his picture, and he said that he wouldn't allow it because his body was already an image of his real self, and why would we want to make an image of my image? So if you're thinking about a metaphysical framework like that, it's easy to lead to the conclusion this guy will have absolutely nothing to tell us about philosophy, at least as we understand it. But that would be wrong. What he has to contribute, I think, is a different way of thinking about the problem of evil. And it goes back to what I said before about this being a metaphysical problem of evil. So the question is not now going to be, why would God create evil? The question is rather going to be, how did God create evil, right? So how can God, who is perfect goodness, give rise to a world that has some evil in it? And Plotinus's answer is in some ways very attractive, because what he's going to say is that to the extent that God created evil at all, he only did it indirectly. It's simply because the world consists of physical objects. What Plotinus is trying to do is expose the demand that there be no evil as the demand that there be no physical world at all. And that's not because, for example, we need free will or anything like that. Rather, it's because the metaphysics of physical objects just necessitates that they are imperfect. And I actually think that there's some plausibility to that. If you think about, for example, a human being, no matter how outstanding a human being you are, the fact that you're a physical object means that you will ultimately die. So if you think that dying is a way of things being imperfect, then you're already committed to the idea that there's imperfection in the world just by saying that there should be physical objects like humans. Peter Adamson, thank you very much. Thank you. And you can hear more Philosophy Bites at www.philosophybites.com. Mm-hmm.